I am here with the lovely and talented and tough Danica <laughs> Patrick. Uh, Danica, thanks for coming into our studios today. We're sure. going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff. Sure. Um, I know <laughs> you've got a video game. I know we're going to obviously talk about NASCAR. Um, but you've actually been in the news somewhat recently within the last week. And I know it's a really tough thing for you to talk about. But you are getting divorced from your husband. And I'm sure a lot of people have been asking you about it. And I'm just wondering how that has gone for you in the last week or so. Um, obviously, it's tough, um, but, you know, my personal life is something that I've always kept really personal, and, you know, I'm not gonna, not gonna play that any differently, but, of course, it's a tough time, so thanks for, thanks for your concern, and thanks for asking. Sure. Well, you know, I think it's uh, more interesting to talk about stuff that you're doing currently in your job, and that is NASCAR. Tell me about what this season was like for you, because obviously you split it between two different circuits, and so I'm kind of curious what that was like and sort of what the challenges were. <laughs> well, the last couple of years I did IndyCar and NASCAR for um, and split my time like that. This year I did um, the NASCAR Nationwide Series and I did some Sprint Cup races. So I think in the end I did 44 races this year, which is by far, well, I think it takes me back to my old go-karting days of, as to how many races I actually have done in a year. But um, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot, um, learned, learned a lot of tracks, learned a lot of, um, you know, how the car changes throughout the race and how to set it up more accurately so it's better for the race um, just you know better communication skills so that I can help my crew chief work on the car better um, and make better changes uh, so it was a it was a big big learning year for sure doing it for the first time you know full-time well there were a lot of changes within the Earnhardt team in particular you obviously had a crew chief change yeah. late in the season when that happens what's that like how do you adjust I mean, I think you have to go in with an open mind. I mean, I think that, you know, some uh, sometimes new things are scary, but I think you have to be open-minded, and I, ha I think you have to um, go in with the best possible attitude, and that's how you get the most out of it. So um, I had a new crew chief at the end of the year in the Nationwide Series and a new crew chief on the Cup side at the end of the year. Um, my, uh, my crew chief on the Cup side will be my crew chief next year, and that was the, the reason for starting early. Um, I, I, feel like, I feel like everybody has something new and great to offer to offer and um, it's just whether or not you sync up with that person or not and um, uh, the one on the nationwide side side Ryan Pemberton he I think he you know he definitely was overwhelmed he was meant to only be sort of a team manager and then he got thrown into the crew chief role as well so it was a big undertaking but uh, he did a nice job and Tony Gibson is uh, on the cup side and he and I get along really well already so I think that we're gonna have a fun year next year it seems like in particular for NASCAR, well, really for, for any racing, but communication is, is so key. That's mm -hmm. got to be a huge factor when you're trying to work with someone new in particular, I'd imagine. I think communication is huge at any time, anywhere, anything you do. Um, Over-communicating is better than under-communicating. And, um, uh, you know, understanding, maybe, maybe even more so than just pure, like, amounts of communication is how you communicate. And, and, and if you can really sort of decode each other and understand, uh, he can understand mostly what I'm saying. Because when I say that the car is two out of five tight in the center of the corner, you know, rolling the center, he needs to understand what that means as far as what I feel to making a change. And so... Um, how that translates how for that, you, Exactly, because right? when I say that a car feels like that and somebody else says a car feels like that, I'm going to almost guarantee you there's no two identical answer the same answers that that feeling and that answer does not are not they do not they're not the same so uh, that's kind of what working with each other does and um, you know once you get used to that and you start understanding amounts and how big a changes you need to make based on my feedback uh, that's when you really start to click it's a coded language it, essence, it is right? it is it's totally that's the, the great way to describe it it's a coded language but then it's like you also have to know how to interpret that code, right? Right, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, you both play a little bit of, you know, uh, emotional coaches, too, because it's easy when you have so many races to get down and it's important to keep everybody up and your your tone of voice even on the radio is 
is really important to keeping the attitude positive overall for everybody. And um, uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's definitely definitely a coded language, though. But you've got to be able to kick people in the ass when you need to, too, right? Well, I think that you need to be honest with people. You know, when they're doing a good job, you need to reward them for that and recognize them for it. But when they're when something's not going right, I mean, I think that you know, as long as you do it in a mildly productive way and you don't try, you know, you know, you don't burn bridges with the things that you say. I think that it can be helpful, um, and it can sometimes be. I mean, shoot, I'm one of these people too. Sometimes you just need a little swift kick and you know it kind of snaps you into shape so uh, I hope I don't ever have to do it but um, but if you do it's all for the greater good well NASCAR has somewhat of a reputation of the drivers not being afraid to mix it up physically <laughs> with each other or verbally obviously uh, Phoenix was somewhat interesting uh, what it was <laughs> interesting wasn't it <laughs> what was that like for why you? do we have to wait until the end of the race to make it good in these cup races <laughs> I feel like we should make like a bunch of sprint races so that it stays interesting although there'd be a lot of carnage I think right <laughs> but, but what's that like for you I mean this is obviously still a somewhat new prospect in a new world that you're entering yeah more or less. Mm -hmm. So, and I know you see, you're not afraid of getting into it with people either. So yeah. does that, does it feel comfortable? Does that feel like this is sort of the environment, the culture that I should be in anyway? Because that's what exists in NASCAR. I do feel the most comfortable. I feel like, uh, it feels like I'm back in my go-karting days again. And, you know, I'm in an eight lap heat race, le you know, leading into the final and I've got, you know, 30 car, 30 go-karts to pass. And you sometimes just got to get a little aggressive and, and move them out of the way. And, so I'm remembering how to do that because in open wheel, that's just not really possible. Um, or if it is, it's dangerous. And, uh, you know, we all see what happens when our wheels climb each other. They end in really big accidents. So, um, but I like getting a little bit rough. I think it's important. I think that the sort of boys have at it attitude or rule, um, as NASCAR has it, is a good one. Um, because, you know, what's what, what I do to somebody else, I know that it could be coming right back to me, if not bigger. And um, they need to know that too. So, uh, you know, I try and I start, start off with respect with everybody and, you know, uh, play it all fair from the beginning. But, you know, one, this is not three strikes and you're out. This is like more like one strike. And the next time I'm going to I'm going to feel like you're coming at me. So, um, so you know, you, you can stand your ground and you don't have to wait for somebody else to make those kinds of decisions and, you know, make disciplinary acts for them um, or you because uh, it's a lot more gray than that. It's not as easy as just looking down at the race and seeing what happens. It's, it's uh, there's finite little things that happen out there that you as a driver only know. Are you still picking up some of those nuances? Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, time is giving me is it's allowing me to um, get more comfortable in the car so I can pick up on the little nuances. Because um, when you're so preoccupied just turning left and trying to keep the thing underneath you, uh, you can um, miss the little things. But if someone does something to piss you off, you're not going to be afraid to challenge them. Well, it might have to be at the end of the race, unfortunately, uh -huh. because that's usually how it happens, what you just said. But it seems like that's not something that you're going to back away from. No, and, uh, you know, at Kansas, I didn't wait for the end of the race. I, I uh, about halfway through the race, I... I decided that there was somebody that had sort of been on my bumper too many times, and I did an absolutely terrible job of taking him out. I took myself out, but, um, you know, the message was sent that I'm not going to put up with people banging me around, and, um, and uh, you know, you might, I don't know, I might have to do that again, but it's not my favorite way to race, but if you have to, then you have to. Do you... Uh, I imagine a lot of interviews you do, a lot of people bring up the fact that you have been aggressive in the past and that you're not afraid to, to mix it up um, with, with your fellow competitors. Um, do you feel, though, that that image of you is, is, is pretty accurate? I mean, imagine that you're asked about it in most interviews. Yeah, I think what pe people have seen most about me over the years is probably my temper because <laughs> I can get a little bit fiery. Um, but what I learned a few years ago is it's a lot more productive to shut your mouth outside of the car and go out on the track and, and take it out on that way. I mean, that's that's the way that it's driven home the best. That's the, the only reason you're there is to do well. And so if somebody takes that away from you on some level, then that's the uh, only thing you really care about. And that's the only thing that you'll you'll react to. Uh, anything else is just, you could ignore it pretty easily. 
Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I was on Facebook and Twitter and all the, you know, social media websites mm -hmm. that exist uh, these days. And I Basically media. You mean media? Because that's pretty much how it is. Well, that it, it is. It I is. mean, it's whether it's citizen journalism or it's just... I think everybody, every company has a social media department now. Yeah, every single one. And I, you know, I was, I said to people, hey, I'm, I'm interviewing Danica Patrick. Let me know if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I do that a lot when I, when I interview people. And uh, I... I probably shouldn't have been surprised by this, just being a woman in a male-dominated industry, but I was actually a little surprised, a little, uh, about um, the amount of responses. A, first of all, just like, you know, trying to sexualize everything, because that certainly seems to happen. But but separate from that is, is um, you know, a lot of venom toward toward you um, and, and your personality and, and whether or not you've accomplished anything in, in your marketing. And, and, and how much do you feel that? I uh, I try to not really read a lot of that stuff or read into it. You know, definitely when it comes to social media and things like that, um, you know, everybody has the ability to put their input in, and they're not um, professional journalists by any means. So they're people giving their opinions, and it tends to be, um, you know, uh, you know, you definitely, I definitely feel like I get a lot of overwhelmingly positive. Um, feedback um, through those channels and from people and fans but uh, you know sometimes the loudest people are the ones that have something bad to say and you know it's it's important to have two sides of the story I, I think it's what makes um, makes it exciting to pay attention to sports and have someone to cheer for and um, and sometimes cheering against somebody is really fun so uh, I for me the most important thing that I can do is do my homework work really hard get the people around me to believe in me and want to be at work with me. And when all that happens, then nothing anybody else says really matters to me. Obviously, as a woman, there's much more attention. Do you get sick of all the women questions, you know, being a woman in this sport, being in a no, male-dominated sport? No, I know that it's part of what got me here. And I know that, um, I know that uh, definitely there are certain points in, points in my career with different things that I do that I use being a woman. Um, so I don't, don't shy away from that at all. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not a problem. I know I am. Clearly, I have long hair. I, it's hard to get away from. You're wearing some makeup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, no, I'm not wearing any makeup. No. Oh, my gosh. That's how I wake up. <laughs> me too. Um, <laughs> but you, you made a, a conscious decision earlier in your career, to, especially when you aligned yourself with GoDaddy, and it seems like it's been a very successful partnership mm -hmm. for both of you guys, but there's a sexualized nature to sure. your marketing. Um, was that a very conscious decision when, for you to make at the time, and has it been since? Uh, yeah, and, um, you know, there definitely, uh, there's been, you know, some criticisms along the way and people that have an opinion, of course. Um, but, I, I mean, I think my, my personality in general is a little polarizing. I mean, you know, when you're something unique or different or something so kind of in your face or repetitious, you know, you're forced to draw an opinion. And I think, I think GoDaddy commercials are a little bit like that. You know, there's so many of them and they're, they're such a successful company. Um, and they've done so well that, uh, that, you know, you're kind of forced to draw your, draw an opinion about it and they're not all going to be positive, but, um, a lot are, and there's no way around the fact that, um, it's been a great partnership for both of us. Um, and it will be moving forward. And, uh, I'm doing both the Super Bowl commercials again this year. And, um, uh, the, we have had a lot of success together, and we've had a lot of fun doing it. And if there was something um, in a commercial or otherwise that I didn't feel comfortable with, I tell them, and we don't do it. So why did you choose to sort of go down that marketing plan, that path? Uh, I, you know, I, I like to just express different sides of my personality through what I do. And sometimes, sometimes it's GoDaddy, and sometimes it's kind of edgy and, you know, more sexy and um, feminine and, um, and a little bit of funny. And other times it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit more lighthearted. It's, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's the Sega video game where I'm, a, I'm an avatar in it and you can play me. I'm a playable character. I mean, there's, there's that side of me. And um, then there's, you know, Tissot watches where we do more fashion-oriented things and, um, you know, or Peak where it's more car-oriented. So they're all just like different sections of me. And, and um, my partners do a really good job of honoring that and um, playing it up. Sounds like you are allowing yourself, I don't want to take too many liberties here, but it sounds like you're allowing yourself to be as much of yourself as who you are as a person as you can in all these different facets. 
Absolutely, and I think that when you, the more yourself you are, then the more it resonates with the fans and the consumers because they can see that. You know, we're not stupid when we watch TV or read read something. We can see when something is real and when it's not real. And um, you know, I'm fortunate enough in my career that I can pick and choose a little bit along the way what it is that I want to do and whether or not they um, that the brands sort of align in a way somewhere. So, and if it doesn't, it doesn't, and it's not right to do. And um, I, if I, if if I'm anything, I hope that I am perceived as being honest and believable. We don't see a ton of emotion from you, or, or mm -hmm. actually, I take that back. We see emotion, yeah. but uh, it's usually in the form of uh, aggressiveness mm -hmm. and and toughness, and obviously mm -hmm. competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Those are like huge traits of yours, mm -hmm. clearly. And for any for many athletes, those are. Um, but there have been a few times where we've seen you get a little bit emotional, um, and I guess uh, probably something that would be ascribed more to our gender in that way, in a more female way. One of them was your first win. It, mm -hmm. Do you worry about ever appearing vulnerable? Sure, I think a little bit. I remember, I remember when I won in Japan and I cried and I just felt like a wimp. <laughs> um, I don't know, but then again, does anybody really like crying in front of anyone? Really? I mean, <laughs> it's never. It's a very vulnerable state, and uh, you know, um, luckily my mom was there to hug me, so I felt better. But um, but uh, and a lot of other people were there too. Um, but. Yeah, I think as an as a as a person, vulnerability is scary, and um, definitely as an athlete, you want to appear tough and kind of more invincible, like and very cool, and yeah, um, you know those things can be compromised when you show that vulnerability. Do you have to overcompensate because you're a woman on the, on the back end of that? <laughs> uh, I think I have a lot of natural toughness anyway, so I find myself toning that down a little bit. So <laughs> I don't think so. Dial it back. Yeah, yeah. Dial it back. I actually have to remind myself to smile. That's more of what I have to do. Right. I actually have that problem quite frequently as well. There it is. There's a smile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, it's just funny when you 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 deliver an answer and you say it like this, and you you know you give it, and then you say it like this, and all of a sudden it just seems. So it's just so much softer and nicer, and I have to remember to do that. Yeah, it's well. It's also something that a lot of people have a tendency to w asking women to smile too, because it's like if you're serious and yeah. mean, then obviously you're cold-hearted, and you know. It's my mom always telling me to be a lady. <laughs> be a lady. All right. So, what I'm also curious about is, so we've talked a little about your career. We've obviously talked about a lot about being a woman in this industry. Um, one of the things I'm really interested about is what people do, what athletes do outside of their sport. And mm -hmm. you've got a couple of interesting things going on. One of which I hadn't heard too much about, and we talked a little bit about this off camera before because you were at another shoot where you were cooking, but you did you take some classes at the Culinary Institute? I did, yeah. Was that in Napa? Yeah. What, okay, in St. Helena, yeah. Okay, so first of all, why? Like, what, do you, Are you like this huge foodie? I love, I just love to cook, okay. um, and I love to eat food, so I'm a foodie too, yeah. Um, but it was, uh, it was, it was just a, a fun little two-day course where you cooked and you, we learned about oils, uh, like olive oils and honeys and salts and peppers and how to use them appropriately. And, um, you know, of course, you'd finish off each day with a, you know, multi-course tasting menu with wine pairings. So um, kind of like heaven. <laughs> really? Well, I mean, what is there a certain type of food that you like to cook in particular? I'm or? not a baker, so anything that doesn't, anything outside of baking. Baking is like a mystery to me. No, it's too calculated for me. It's sort of mathematical. Yeah, and I'm, I don't know, that takes the fun out of it for me. I like manipulating things and putting weird seasonings together or making, um, adding elements to create different textures and flavor profiles. And with baking, it's just, you know, follow the, follow the, follow the sheet. Right. And if you had a last meal, what would it be? <laughs> oh, man, it's got to be like, I don't know, like foie gras. I love foie gras. That's a fancy food. Um, uh, probably pizza, just because I don't know why pizza sounds. Pizza's just great. Awesome. Maybe some chocolate cake or um, something chocolatey. I don't know. What kind of wine? Probably some red wine. That's that's definitely on the <laughs> just menu. Skip the food. <laughs> I think I'd go straight to some uh, straight to some screaming eagle if I were gonna die. Is that is that your go to? It's uh, oh no, it's not a go to because I I don't have any. <laughs> but I have other ones. But it's a really famous sort of wine from uh, from from Northern California, from Napa, and uh, it, yeah, it's just like quite a cult wine anyway. You, you do it up. I have had some, but I don't own any. You don't own any. <laughs> okay, so pizza, chocolate cake, Screaming Eagle, if, <laughs> if you can get your hands on it. Yeah. Um, what else do you like to do? 
Um, I heard you like to travel. I do like to travel. I love to travel. I love to see new places. Went to South Africa last year, New Zealand the year before that. Um, love to see new places, new cultures, try new foods. Um, that's fun. You know, New Zealand was really good for, um, they had a lot, lamb and venison products, and South Africa was more, lots of, lots of, um, like, venison-like products, deer, you know, kind. Did um, you take any risks, any, any weird foods that you'd never tried before? Um, yeah, I mean, the very first day was, uh, what, what was it, Springbok was the first thing, what first thing we had. That? It's a kind of deer, yeah. It's, oh, is it? It was delicious. <laughs> you gotta try it. Springbok? Yeah. Never heard of it. Yeah. How was it or, cooked? Um, yeah, yeah, it's like, it was like medallions. Like it was, must have been kind of, maybe it was pan seared and roasted in the oven or something and they sliced it into medallions. But is there any food that if someone put it in front of you, you're like, I am not touching that. I, mean, I'm I can't not, do I it. I can't say I wouldn't be a real big, I wouldn't be a real big fan of like an alligator or, um, uh, you know, weird things like that, snake or, uh, I mean, I eat sushi, so yeah. that's, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with fish and raw things, uh, but, there's not much I won't try, but those kind of, those sound gross. Yeah, yeah. I've probably found more cocktails that I don't like than food, so. <laughs> really? Yeah. I wish I had that problem. <laughs> uh, Weird okay. con concoction. Weird, strange potions. Uh, one country that you want that's on your list that you want to visit that you haven't been to. Um, I mean, I'd really like to go to Europe all over the place, but um, I think I'd like to do Italy. I just feel like between the wine and the, you know, beautiful cities and the art and the architecture and uh, the history, I think maybe there would probably be high up on the list to go to. Um, and France for the wine in general. And probably hit the, hit the coast at the end of the trip, you know? Right. Oh, man, that'd be awesome. Wouldn't it? Oh, okay. Let's go. All right. <laughs> I'm holding to so it, poking it. <laughs> See you guys. Uh, all right, so wine, Italy, uh, travel, those are all great fun things. There's not a lot of time for that Cooking. with all the other stuff I do. Right, well, honestly, yeah, I, I actually am curious about that. What's your schedule from now until the season starts, and how are you sort of getting prepared for that? Um, uh, you know, obviously, um, I'm doing, like today, I'm I'm uh, promoting the new uh, the new Sega game, Sonic and, Head Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed, so that's what I'm doing today. We have another day booked for next week in LA um, to promote it as well. Um, well, let's talk, before we get, let's talk about that. So, so it's a, it's this is the first time that you uh, that you think you know that you've really been uh, transformed into a video game, as in like yeah. here's your avatar, you're there. It's kind of cool, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm a, I'm I'm a character in a game. Um, I'm playable and I'm awesome, so play me. Obviously. <laughs> um, Duh. So, but what, how did like what was the process involved? I know you, we went, you did some voiceovers. Yeah, we did. But... So we went into a voiceover studio, and uh, the director or producer was super intense. And at first, he's like, "When you start sweating, you know you're going to be doing you're doing it right." And I'm like, "What is this guy talking about?" And um, sure enough, you know, once you really like like give the voice what it needs and make it sound real, mm -hmm. um, sure, you sure as heck. Break sweat. It's weird. Um, yeah. Another thing, when uh, since it's voiceover, if your l mouth is clicking, like if your mouth is dry at all, mm -hmm. they give you green apples to make that stop. So mm -hmm. I, there were slices of green apples for that. Did so you, did you use them? I needed one at one point. Did yeah. You? Yeah. Weird. Um, but that was really fun, and they let me sort of change the words and make it really authentic to what would actually be said in the car. They really wanted to know all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my my character shoots like. Flame, balls of flames uh, out of it, so it's you know it has a special superpower, and you know they let me really play a part in all that stuff, which was neat. It was you know it's not just getting stuffed into a game; it's you know really making it as as authentic as possible. And you know it's obvious that's why companies like Sega have been around so long because they do a good thorough job. Right, it's the hedgehog. Like, yeah, that dude's it's been, been around. around that guy's been around forever. Exactly. And so, and what you're telling me is that it's like a, it's it's. It's transformers in essence, it's, right? Yeah. So transform basically means that you go from um, flying through the air to driving on land to on the water, um, you know, racing racing a boat. So uh, you kind of play all those different stages in the game. Um, and it's uh, there are some that are harder than others. That's for I mean, obviously I'm best on land. I would hope. So. I think the water might be the hardest. Is it? Yeah. I'm, well, it, well, that makes sense. 
Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, not working with enough aerodynamics in that car. Mm -mm. No, no, they didn't get them right. Because <laughs> race it. cars are kind of like upside down airplanes. Right. So that that makes, that makes sense. sense. They're screwing it up in the water. Um, mm -hmm. So. Did they get your, does it look like you? Because, you know, people, yeah. like, you look at bobbleheads, and mm -hmm. sometimes you look at some athletes' bobbleheads, and you're like, I have no idea who that person is because it's well, not the long, the dark hair gives it away. <laughs> but it, it's, you it feel does. like, it's yeah. going to be a little weird to see yourself in that way, right? Yeah. Cool. I just said, make me look better than I really do. Awesome. So, mm -hmm. all right, so that game's available, I'm told. Now. now yep. Right? Mm -hmm. I think you can play it on the Wii U. Mm -hmm. I think you can play it on Xbox 360. Mm -hmm. They say all of them, right? PS3. I yeah, mean, I think virtually all of them. All of yeah, them. basically all the consoles. That's keeping you busy. Obviously, you're yep, going around talking about that. That's what I'm doing that. right now. But uh, after that, um, uh, GoDaddy's got their Christmas party uh, coming up next next weekend, next Friday, I think. What? So, it's a GoDaddy Christmas party. Like, uh, have you, have let's you been see. to one before? Oh yeah, okay. I've been to all of them. Okay, uh, all of them that I've been sponsored right. by GoDaddy. Right. Um, so, who performed last year was uh, uh, Trace Adkins, um, Kid Rock. And gosh, there was one other one that I can't remember right now. Jewel sang, she was meant to sing the national anthem. Mm -hmm. um, maybe this was last year or the year before. Uh, this, it was the year before. But instead, she kind of stayed on stage and sang a few extra songs and um, yodeled a little bit. I mean, I was super excited to meet her, actually. Uh, so they, they just get some amazing performers. And there's, when I first went, there might have been two or 3,000 people, and now there's like five. And so uh, they um, they do it inside of the baseball stadium downtown um, Phoenix, oh, and cool. they have it all closed up. the The roof is closed, and then at the end of the night, they send everyone home by opening up the roof and doing some fireworks. And then it obviously gets so darn cold, and there you got to go. Right. <laughs> so you do the, so you do the Christmas party, the big GoDaddy blowout Christmas yeah. party, and then is it um, training? You know, Super Bowl commercials have been floating around all kinds of different dates. So um, I feel like you know, there's a little bit of time in December that they might do it, and then there might be some time in January they might do it. You haven't so shot those yet. have not shot them. Okay. Don't know exactly what date. Don't know what they're going to be about. They're always so secretive about that stuff, right. but it keeps it exciting. So, um, you know, going to uh, my folks for the holidays and spending time with them, and um, my sister's getting married this weekend, so I'm, I'm going out to do that and uh, helping her out. So I'm the maid of honor. I have no idea what my speech is going to be yet. Uh, well, are you, do you Have you done it? maid of honor speeches? No, thank God. This is my third <laughs> one, and I... Really? I'm like either the maid of honor or I'm not not even invited to the wedding, it seems like. <laughs> right, so it's either up on the stage or yeah. just like opting out. And so I'm not afraid to, uh, I'm not afraid to speak in public. That's not something I'm concerned about. Not I just want to make sure that it sounds good. But do you, are you one of those people that you wing it or do you actually write it down and try and read? Um, most of the time, with stuff like that, I get like an idea in my head and I wing it. And uh, But I started writing some stuff down for this. I started writing like, I started writing good qualities down. And I thought, how am I going to make this all come together and like add something maybe funny, although I'm not very funny. So how am I going to add something, Try how am I going to try and be funny and yet be sweet and bring it all together? So... Well, this is your only sibling. I hope it, I'm. I think I'm late. I'm the second to last, or I'm the last one. So hopefully, people are drunk by then. Yeah, and they won't even really remember it. No. Yeah. Just who cares? In fact, I'm going to tell the waiter <laughs> to overpour. <laughs> Pour everyone a lot, a yes. lot of alcohol. Yes. Celebration. <laughs> right. I'll do like you know ten toasts. I'll be the one that's like banging on the champagne glass all the time. <laughs> right. Like keep keep it coming, guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, all right, so you got all that stuff going on, and then looking forward yeah. to next season. Yeah, some testing. Then we start mm -hmm. testing already the second week in January in Daytona, and um, then there's another test uh, another week or two later, and, you know, you kind of hit the ground running. And I've done a lot of print campaign stuff to get ready for next year for a bunch of sponsors, so everybody's getting their 13 campaign stuff um, all done so that so it's ready to go in February. And end of February, it all starts again, so the season goes by super fast. What's going to be the biggest challenge for you being on that circuit full time next year as you prepare? Uh, staying confident. I think that's that's always the toughest part in the beginning um, is just keeping your confidence up and keeping the morale up around you, um, knowing that there'll be tough days and not getting wrapped up in the finishes every single time, and um, you know, not you know, keep making little goals so that you can achieve them and um, keep your head up. What are what are some of those small goals? I mean, honestly, it's stuff as simple as, you know, 
uh, qualifying the top 25 and then it'll be qualifying the top 22 and then it'll be like qualifying the top 20 and you know little goals like that along the way and I mean I was I finished up the the cup season at uh, Phoenix with what was going to be a pretty good finish I was uh, I think I started 37th or something like that and uh, so maybe my first goal should be qualifying the top 35 there we go start there <laughs> um, and then uh, but I, uh, I I was running 13th with one lap to go and I was sort of bumped into the wall and um, spun. Anyway, I still finished 17th, but going for, you know, 13th was um, was a good cup race for me. So um, so it was a nice way to finish, not the crash, but just the hope and the speed and the pace in the race uh, at a tough track. Phoenix is a tough short track, and it got all the team very excited for next season, and that's the kind of attitude we need. Is there anything physically that you have to do? I mean, I know this year you you, you raced a ton um, yeah. between both circuits. It, physically, looking forward to next year. The biggest thing physically is um, during the season, and especially in the summer months, holy moly, we had the hottest summer ever, I feel like, this year, um, is just hy hydration, really. Um, I know it sounds silly. The cars are not physically that hard to drive, so um, there's a lot of repetition. Um, obviously with this motion for so, so long. Uh, but it's really just about keeping focused and that that that's um, that goes down when you're not hydrated. So uh, just keeping that up because when you're bouncing from car to car and you know day to day in the 100 degree humidity in the summer, it takes a lot out of you. If we talk a year from now, mm -hmm. where do you hope you'll end your year and, and what goals do you have that you hope you achieve? Mm. I haven't really thought about that exactly, and I haven't talked to my crew chief about that yet. Um, you know, I plan on sitting down with him and coming up with some real goals overall for the year. Um, but uh, so I, I think it's tough to say, but for me in my position, learning and there'll be new cars next year uh, in Sprint Cup. So, you know, not knowing how that's all going to um, play out for every team. Uh, sometimes there's surprises along the way and all of a sudden, you know, you're you feel really competitive one year and you just can't kind of can't get it together the next and so and other times you struggle and then the next year some for some reason whether it's a new car or new personnel all of a sudden things come together so um, it's tough to be able to tell what exactly you should expect going into the next year so that's why I think it's important to um, to uh, find little victories every race along the way and some of them are uh, learning from mistakes but um, hopefully lots of them are, are, are learning from you know how to do things right so you know how to do them better in the future or do them again like that in the future. Well, you talk about little victories, and obviously that's smart, and you got to pace yourself. It's a really, really long season. It is a really long season. There's, um, you know, 30, 36 races, I believe, before any of the extras, and then I'm, I'm hoping to do at least 10 nationwide races. So, you know, I'll be looking towards almost 50 races next year. 50. So. Um, just about, so that's all right. It's, you know, I find myself at the track and when I don't have to do nationwide and cup, I almost feel bored. So <laughs> bring it on. Bring it on. Keep yeah. busy. What about, what about big victories? Um, big victories. I mean, obviously, I, I mean, while I'd love to win, of course, I think those kinds of things are possible at like some of the big tracks like Daytona or Talladega where, um, it's a little bit less about the familiarity of the car and the, and the, and the, um, uh, how far do you can take it and 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 the limits of that it's more about you know strategy and being smart and staying in the race and planning out how you're going to execute the very end of the race which is um, it's like a high speed chess match in those one those races which is a lot like IndyCar and that's kind of probably why I adapt so quickly and well to them um, I think that you know if I can you know start racing into the top 10 I mean um, you know, more consistently, I, mean, I think that would be huge. I think that's a really tough, that's a, that's, it's a tough group of drivers and I've got a lot of respect for a lot of guys out there. And, um, you know, if I can come in in the first year and start mixing it up like that, I think that would be really huge. Do you have to win to placate critics? Um, I, I think that, uh, um, winning is just something simple that everybody understands. It's like, you don't, no matter what sport it is, if somebody wins in it, you can instantly say, wow, that's great. You must be really good at it. Um, so uh, luckily, I mean, my world is not run by those people. So um, I don't really have to, but um, I can tell you that I want to, and I can tell you that that's what's most important to me, and that's my goal. And, you know, that's kind of why you see that temper and fire come out of me is because that's what I want. And, uh, um, you know, I just, um, I'm driven to get there. 
All right, well, you're driven to get there. You are going to be working towards it this winter. You're going to be doing GoDaddy stuff, commercials for Super Bowl. You're going to be, people are going to be playing you, or playing <laughs> you in the Sonic Hedgehog game uh, that's going to be coming, that is out, and you're going to be promoting that. And uh, I don't know, maybe you'll get a little bit of wine drinking in too. Oh, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Danica Patrick, thank you so much for coming and talking to us Thank today. you so much.